Hello, Space Fans, and welcome to our next Space Fan Hangout. And um, today I'm really excited because we get, I, we, I always love a chance to talk about space telescopes. And in particular, we're going to be talking about the web, that is the James Webb. Oh, I always wanted to do it. Web. James <laughs> Space telescope. Uh, sorry, it just came into my mind, and my mouth doesn't always filter the things that come to my head. So, it, this is uh, this is our uh, opportunity to sort of talk a little bit about some amazing things that have happened recently in the mission. And uh, with me today is Dr. Alberto Conti. Hello, Alberto. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you, Tony? Nice I'm to good. see you. Yeah, it's good to see you too. Um, so, how's your knee doing? I heard you. Uh, I, heard you I, heard, I heard you blew it out playing for the Ravens or something. It's like Jason, that. who is another. Guy. Yes, it was days very soon. I'm getting old. <laughs> used parts, used parts, used parts. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna have a bionic knee very soon. Yes. So you doing okay? You doing okay? You doing yeah, okay. okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, you know, I don't know what I heard. It was something about ravens and signing bonuses and things like that. So uh, <laughs> yeah, that's stuff like that. D don't forget your friends if when you give that signing bonus comes in. So. All right. <laughs> anyway, um, so Alberto, we are coming off of what has been discussed described as the most amazing, the greatest, the most successful, the most stupendously awesome education and public outreach event in the history of the Webb Space Telescope <laughs> mission, right? Uh, yeah, that's a pretty tall order, but I think it's correct in this case. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So, and we're going to talk about what that mean, what what that means here in just a little bit. And today, it is I am I am really thrilled because I have the core team, the people who were responsible for putting this event together, the the Justice League of Austin, the superstars <laughs> that were the the, the uh, superheroes that were responsible for putting this event together. And we're going to talk a lot about what went on, how uh, things came together and, you know, a little bit about the Webb uh, Space Telescope itself. But uh, before I get going, I have to get the, uh, before we do the introductions, I have to do the social media part of this whole thing. So uh, otherwise, it's, you know, we got we to gotta get interaction going. So tweet at us, comment on us, inquire your, inquis your inquis inquisitate your inquiries to us uh, in the following ways. If you tweet using the hashtag SpaceFan, I'll see it. If you comment or inquisitate on either the uh, Google Plus event page or the YouTube uh, channel or the YouTube page, video page where this is streaming, I will also see those and we will interact with us. I command you to do that because if you don't, this not social media. This is social media. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of us talking to each other while the internet watches and that's not social. That's just creepy. So please interact, communicate, and let us know what you think. Ask us questions, and we'll, you've got the right people here to do it. So let's get started with some introductions. Alberto is the James Webb Space Telescope innovation scientist, as you, you've seen him do many of these hangouts with me. Uh, so welcome, Alberto. I'm, I'm going to do your introduction for you, but everybody else, I want to do them uh, their own. So I'm just going to go from left to right and just have you introduce yourselves. Amber? Hi there. Hi. I want you to tell, introduce yourself and tell us what you do. Sure. So um, I'm an astrophysicist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. So um, my kind of base of my job is I study galaxies with Hubble, which is pretty awesome. Uh, and then on the, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope in particular, um, I serve as the Deputy Project Scientist for Communications and Outreach. So I do lots of things like the South by Southwest Festival and social media, all kinds of other fun things to kind of get the awesome science um, story out to the public. Awesome. Okay. And next we have Blake Bullock. Hi, Blake. Hello. Hi, my name is Blake Bullock, and I am at Northrop Grumman Aerospace Systems in Redondo Beach, California, right next to Hollywood, of course. Like the whole <laughs> and Very I'm good. responsible for the science and technical advocacy for not only the James Webb Space Telescope, but other astrophysics business that we do here at Northrop Grumman. Outstanding. Awesome. And Christina. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Christina Thompson, also from Northrop Grumman. I'm the communications lead for the James Webb Space Telescope, which means I'm responsible for media and public outreach uh, through STEM education, um, interactions with the public, both um, congressional and um, media. Uh, thank you. And Jason? Hey, Where everyone. Yeah, I'm a research astronomer here at the Space Telescope Science Institute. I study uh, stellar evolution, 
direction, how stars evolve, uh, how they change over time. I'm also the deputy project scientist for JWST. And Maggie, hello. Hi, sorry, I had my muted. I'm, I'm not even saying. Oh, you were being polite. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not sure my office might, might come back, so I wanted to keep the mic off just in case there was excess noise. I know anyway. that's always awkward, right? You're trying to do like a broadcast on air, and your 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 office mates over there talking to her boyfriend or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm Maggie Massetti. I work on the website for James Webb Space Telescope over at NASA Goddard, and I also do all our social media. And I also do education and public outreach, and South by Southwest was so exciting. It was such a big event for social media, so I was really happy to be a part of it. Oh, great. Well, welcome to everybody. So this has been one of those, I've met most of you uh, that weekend we were out and in Austin, and I got to say, the team that was assembled there was really outstanding. A lot of really, really talented people were together doing all kinds of stuff. So, Alberto, you want to start with some opening comments? Yeah, I want to say, want to say one thing first. So you, I, I I appreciate your introduction. So we have one thing that we're missing, though. So the core team is almost all here. So oh, unfortunately, yes. we're missing we're missing Stratus Cacadelis, who is wounded beyond recognition, I suppose, uh, and uh, so he couldn't join us uh, here today. But he was uh, he was a big part of uh, the team as well that uh, put all this stuff together in uh, in Austin. So hi, Stratus, if you're watching. Yeah, and Strat it was actually his idea to actually do the South correct, South correct. South. I was so, actually gonna gonna start with that and saying that. Uh, 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 everything we're going to talk about today is something that uh, many of us put together. It took uh, a long time, a lot of uh, uh, energetic people like the ones you see at the bottom of your screen today that uh, that uh, put together this, uh, in, this very, very incredible event. And I think it started with an idea to do something that was sort of completely out of the box. You know, and, uh, and Stratus, uh, I think almost a year ago or so, came up with this idea to say, what kind of audience could we reach if we go to an event like South by Southwest? West. And Saba Southwest, West, uh, for the people that don't know what it is, it's uh, it's sort of an incubator, if you will, for new technologies. It's a film uh, and uh, and um, a music festival that has an interactive portion that has become uh, extremely uh, popular and extremely interesting. In 2007, at Saba West, uh, they launched Twitter, just to give you an idea of how big it has become. And we were very lucky because uh, uh, once we had this idea. Uh, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope and everything we're going to talk about it today, from uh, you know the full scale model to the experience that we had in the, in this gigantic tent and everything else that we're going to show you, was sort of uh, was sort of picked up by South by Southwest as a centerpiece for the, their science and space exploration theme, which was uh, which was absolutely fantastic. Um, yesterday, actually, uh, in an email from the organizers, we got the confirmation of how many people actually attended South by Southwest. Uh, Blake, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought it was uh, over 40,000 people in those uh, in those few. Days Days that we were there, uh, and then a good portion of those attended this event that we had planned for uh, for the people, uh, and perhaps even uh, about fifteen thousand. So um, we had, you know, I'm going to keep this very brief, but we had very few objectives when we went there, and 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 I think we accomplished uh, all of them, and. Uh, and many, many more, actually. So we wanted to start a, di a different dialogue with di different audience about JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope. We would need to launch a sort of awareness of the telescope, but also talk about uh, um, STEM and education in general, you know, science uh, and engineering, and, and bring sort of uh, uh, people that are very engaged in technology to understand what it takes to put a telescope like that out there and what kind of science it will eventually do. And ultimately, we wanted to reach as many people as we could with this very, very different medium. It's something very new that we, have, uh, we haven't done before. Um, so I'll stop here. What I would like to do now is just go around and to some extent and, and hit on, the, on, on sort of the, the things that we, that we thought about doing. And I, I, I wanted to start with, uh, with Blake because after Stratus and uh, sort of uh, had the idea here and we started thinking about what to do with it, the centerpiece of uh, sort of, of the exhibit was this gigantic uh, full-scale model uh, of the James Webb Space Telescope that we we had to bring to Austin, basically, right, Blake? That's right. You know, uh, in Northrop Grumman, uh, when we were we had the privilege of uh, being selected by NASA to partner with them to build James Webb Space Telescope. One thing that we fortunately realized early on was that it's really impossible to grasp the scale of something on this size that's four stories tall, that's the size of a tennis court without really seeing it with your own eyes. And so we decided to build a full-scale model or mock-up of James Webb Space Telescope. And so when uh, Stratus from Space Telescope Science Institute first came to us with the idea, 
we really did start with this notion of if we were to take our four story tall model of the telescope and put it in the place that really is um, a place to see what's unraveling in the world of technology, what's next. It would be an unsurpassing its ability to attract the attention, to pull people in, and really start that conversation and, and make something like this accessible to such a large group of people. And that was what it was all about. So that full-scale model really was at the heart of creating the draw to bring the crowds to, uh, to where we were showcasing. So can you get, So how big is it? Well, it's about 40 feet tall and about 80 feet across on its footprint. So if you look at the picture on the screen, the height is about that of a four-story building. The bottom uh, layers that look almost like a trampoline, each one of those layers is about the size of a tennis court, about 80 feet long and 40 feet wide. It's a, sort of a diamond shape. So standing underneath it, is, it's almost like standing near a small building. It's incredible to think about the fact that this uh, piece of hardware will be folded up launched into space and uh, sitting on orbit taking pictures just like Hubble. That's, um, it was actually quite a sight. I just put up the image before. I wanted to, I wanted to actually show something else, which is uh, also the fact that, you know, there was, there was a lot of stuff. Let me see if I can put the image back, back up again. But there was a lot of uh, things that were surrounded by this uh, gigantic model. So what you see here is the, the beautiful image that uh, I guess one of the photographers there, I don't know if it was... Uh, Chris or Alex took uh, about uh, of the of the entire exhibit, but the idea was to draw people to this uh, gigantic model and try to draw them into understanding what it takes to build the model, what it takes to build uh, um, the infrastructure that goes around. And it's kind of hard to see here. I don't know if people can see this, but there's a fence which is illuminated, which uh, which we'll we'll touch upon a little bit later. But uh, on the far right, there was this uh, gigantic tent that we decided was was going to hold uh, sort of uh, uh, talks and uh, bring people in to understand after they've been awed by this telescope basically uh, you know what what is NASA doing for this you know what is the what's the future of astrophysics and why web is so important and so um, I'm gonna put up a map as, as I give the the mic so to speak to to Amber so Amber uh, can you tell us a, a little bit about what what was inside that tent what kind of experience people uh, had when they walked around this fence which we're gonna we're gonna show a little bit later but uh, what was inside of the tent? What were our ideas about putting stuff inside the tent? Sure. So we called this the uh, the NASA Experience Tent. So what we really wanted to do, or the whole idea behind <laughs> this... Eddie promptly drops out. <laughs> oh, bye, Alberto. Please yeah. come back. Yes, uh, I'm, no, I'm <laughs> what back. we wanted to do um, for the tent was to bring in all of our, our partners. So um, the, the telescope, obviously, is, um, is led by NASA. Um, Northrop Grumman is our prime contractor. And then um, they have several subcontractors. Um, and, and each of those different partners, uh, including Space Telescope Science Institute, um, had a, a big part in making um, all of of the, the kind of the different pieces, the different stories behind the telescope come together and we wanted to showcase that inside the tent. So um, the, the kind of um, centerpiece of what was going on inside that big tent was um, a visualization wall from Microsoft. So that was incredible, that was a huge draw for the crowds. We had um, really impressive presentations um, going on on, si on this huge um, kind of 10 by 20 foot uh, visualization wall. <coughs> Um, so we had scientists and engineers uh, giving talks on the wall. Uh, we had talks every half hour, so just one after the other. It was very dynamic um, and lots of uh, Q&A from the, the audiences that were there. So um, that was a big centerpiece of the tent. And then we had all our partners um, bring, you know, a kind of hardware for the public to kind of touch and feel and see. We had an infrared camera uh, demo that was going on where kids were, you know, playing with ice and hair dryers to, to be able to see and experience um, how infrared light, how infrared radiation works. Um, we partnered with uh, some local schools in Austin who had been working on art projects that had to do with the Webb Telescope. Uh, they displayed some of their art projects there, and some of the kids and teachers actually came to the tent uh, to see their stuff on display. Um, so it was really just kind of an all-encompassing, um, had all of our partners involved uh, so that we could um, really just tell the story of, of the telescope coming together. And I think I also put up what I, what I was looking for. I couldn't find it before. Just to give you an idea of the scale, this is, a, I guess, a, a, a floor plan that, we, that many of us have seen many, many times in so, you know, all the planning for all the months and everything else. But it just gives you an idea of what the kind of event we put together. As Blake said, the telescope is, is extremely large, and it's, uh, this footprint is like of a tennis court. And we had this uh, fence around it. But then we had this tent that... Uh, 
Amber just mentioned, and at the very back of this tent, which was 110 feet long, we had this uh, uh, tremendous visualization wall. So people, we, we kind of thought about this through quite a bit, correct me if I'm wrong, but we, we basically wanted to, to people to experience uh, NASA as they were coming in, so to speak, and the awe about uh, uh, the infrared and taking a look at STEM and what we do, and then be sort of uh, led to the back of the tent where people like Jason, where people like... Um, Jay Bola, where people like John Matter, where people like uh, Sarah Seeger, you know, experts in, you know, and, uh, and astronomers, uh, Matt Mountain, for example, our director, where people sort of gave talks about what kind of science. And giving a talk, uh, you know, having given many talks, and maybe Jason can speak to this, but uh, having given many talks uh, in front of a screen, this wall was quite impressive, and we built special tours for this. So, so how was it, Jason? How was giving a talk in front of a Viz wall? Yeah, it was amazing. It was a it was an amazing format. So the collaboration that we had with Microsoft and the Worldwide Telescope was very useful for this. Uh, we worked with Microsoft and built uh, tours uh, that tried to demonstrate the science that the telescope's going to do in a real environment. So we could show the scientific reach of the James Webb Space Telescope by, um, you know, moving from our solar system to nearby stars and galaxies all the way out to deep fields, and highlight the kinds of astrophysical objects that it's going to study. Uh, on the uh, on the worldwide telescope, so this screen was gigantic, and it helped um, you know it helped us communicate the science effectively. We had uh, you know hundreds of people sitting there for hours at a time listening to these talks, and some of the more uh, popular presentations were the, the ones that Alberto mentioned by uh, Matt Mountain, who talked about exoplanets and finding life uh, in the universe. Uh, John Mather talked about the, the overall scientific reach of the James Webb Space Telescope, and also uh, Tom Weiss, the president of uh, Northrop Grumman Aerospace Systems, uh, who talked about the marriage between science and engineering that enables a project like, like this. Uh, it was actually it was quite a quite a feat. And so let me let me get back to that to that floor plan that I, I talked about before. I thought I thought it was uh, uh, interesting to showcase a few things. But um, among the things that actually we thought about was how to engage the public on the way, if you will, to the tent, which was where we sort of explained the science and uh, and. I think the, uh, what was done, and I thought it was done in a, in, a, in a great, great way, was this uh, graphic fence that, we, that was ac actually out there. So I know that Christina, for example, was involved in taking a look at how we can draw. That's, that's what they do, you know, that's what Christina and Maggie do in terms of social media, but also trying to draw people in. How do we engage the public into actually uh, not only coming there, but I try to understand what's going on, and, and how did the idea of the fence come about, for example? Well, Alberto, um, when we brought the full-scale model to other locations um, around the world and around the United States, um, we oftentimes just set up the full-scale model and have it sitting there and have people around to talk to the public. But one piece of feedback I got was that um, people were confused, you know, what is this thing? And they couldn't see just right away uh, what it was without walking up and talking to someone. So. Um, we decided that it would be really helpful if we could give people um, a way to just look over and first of all see the name. We had the James Webb Space Telescope on large billboards spread um, several places throughout the fence so that they could just quickly at a glance see what this was and remember the name. And then we also um, put our core messages um, about the telescope. You know, it's not just launching a telescope, it's launching careers and technologies and, you know, dreams and future for students who are interested in studying space and science. Um, and then we also wanted to give people a way to kind of lead from, you know, walking up to the model and round the corner to get to our tent where it was set up sort of in the back. So that afforded us an opportunity to put the science messages, the four key things that the Webb Telescope will help scientists study, and then also to explain the engineering behind how you get something that large, as Blake said, you know, how do you get something that's 40 feet, you know, to fold up and fit inside a rocket and then launch out into space. So we were able to show how it unfolds in space. And one other key piece of that fence was the timeline for the program. Um, we had the milestones that we've achieved so far to date listed out on the, the graphic fence, and then it led inside where you could actually go in and, and talk with real engineers and scientists working on the program. 
you know, yes. Christina, can I just jump in for one yeah, second? Yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, you know, I think you pointed out something really interesting about the program timeline. I think, you know, when you when you step back and you look at some of the really successful advocacy and outreach work that's been done for science missions, um, you know, obviously the things that come to mind are the incredible uh, work with the Mars rovers, the outstanding things that have... Uh, that have reached the public with the Hubble Space Telescope. But I think one thing that really stands out about the work on James Webb is that you keep in mind the telescope will launch in 2018. So the fact that we're talking about a mission that's still uh, five years away from its launch date and able to engage people, I think that's something really different that happened here. Um, and I think, you know, the reason we're doing that is because um, all of us as citizens and as taxpayers are investing in work like this now. There are inventions that are happening today. There are spin-off technologies that people are benefiting from now. But, you know, we don't actually, uh, aren't actually able to have those James Webb Space Telescope images in our hand for quite some time. But that doesn't mean that we can't reach out and connect with the public and bring some of the, um, some of the excitement of the discoveries and, the, and some of that science that uh, people like Jason and Amber and some of the wonders of the technology and the inventions that are happening at Northrop Grumman, at Paul, at TK, and ITT and make some of those connections today. So I just wanted to take a second to point that out because I think that really is something different. I, yeah, I, also, I, if I can jump in quickly here, I just want to um, echo what Blake said, but also add the fact that we had all of these young students come by and ask us questions. And I felt like a program like this, where we, where we enabled all of these scientists and engineers to directly talk to the the students that were there uh, was tremendous and it, it broke barriers in how to do STEM education, for example. And if you think about JWST, Blake mentioned it's going to launch in 2018. If it has a 10 year life, that's out till 2028. And so the graduate students and the postdocs that are going to be using this telescope in the 2020s are in high school and middle school right now. And so it was great to talk to them right now and get them excited about science and engineering and hopefully they'll follow those fields as they go through school. So I have a question about this too, real quick. The Jason and Amber, the two of you guys, were like the face of this whole event. I mean, you guys were. You must have done a billion interviews. Okay, that's an exaggeration. Maybe maybe a little less. But um, you guys were on all the time. And I guess I'd like to get your impressions on what you know. So as you talk to these students, as you talk to the general public, did anything stand out? Did anything surprise you at all about this? About just meeting the people and what their impressions were with JWST? Well, I think one of the, the cool things about um, being at the South by Southwest Festival is I think the audience that we reached was brand new yeah. um, in, a lo in a lot of senses. Um, you know, we have, of course, a kind of a fan base at NASA, people that, that you know, know NASA and love NASA and love the things that we do. Um, but we kind of were branching out at this festival. We were trying to engage with an audience that was very tech interested and, you know, um, kind of up on all the latest technology, but might not have known about the Webb Telescope in particular. So I think um, reaching out to that audience was, was really great. A lot of them, um, you know, were obviously familiar with NASA, but didn't know about the mission. Um, so I was I was kind of surprised at um, how many people, you know, had had heard, obviously had heard of NASA, had heard of Hubble, but um, didn't know about us. And then after we were able to introduce them and tell them about all the awesome things that Webb will do, um, they're they're huge fans now. They're um, you know on board and excited about the telescope. So that was really uh, one thing that stood out to me that I thought was really cool. Yeah, and the same here. I noticed. I mean, I was surprised just the, the people I talked to wandering around. There were people there that didn't even know there was a Hubble Space Telescope, and I thought that was amazing. I said, "We." They'd go, "What is this thing?" And I'd say, "Well, that's the James Webb Space Telescope. That's Hubble's successor." And they said, "What's Hubble?" <laughs> so you're right about that. We were definitely reaching people who weren't the choir. They weren't the fanboys. They weren't the people who follow NASA around uh, all over the place and know everything they're doing. But, but I have so, to say. But I have to say, I think we changed all of that to some extent because I have photos. I, I, I keep playing some once in a while some photos instead of my face over there, which is uh, it's a little slideshow that shows. Yeah, thank what you for that, Alberto. That, we're all appreciating. Yeah. That. And I, I'm gonna continue that, but I wanted to say something. I wanted to say something, which was the fact that I have some pictures. I don't know if I can find them right now, but of people, young people, that was uh, the most touching thing for me. It was young people in awe of John Mather's talk. I mean, that tent was as packed as you can imagine. And they don't, and, and, and I think Jason and I were talking about this. You know, people did not stay there for like 20 minutes. They stayed there for hours. 
they were they could basically they were as close to a Nobel Prize winner or close to Amber, close to Jason. You know, people that do astronomy for uh, every day, uh, you uh, close to close to expert. They could touch them, and they, you could feel almost the excitement in these folks to to be able to well, ask. That, him sounded, to that sounded weird. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, touch them in a sense, you know. You know, I, I don't know. That's the astronomer would not work well. I agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, yeah. No, no, but Alberto's uh, Alberto's uh, absolutely correct. I mean, often when we're doing public outreach or we're giving a talk, it's a one-way conversation, right? I mean, yes. we're communicating with somebody and they're receiving the information this was different this was you know going into the nuts and bolts and describing the details of how you know scientists come up with a vision but to execute that vision it was the engineers that came together embraced it built a whole bunch of technologies through innovation and satisfied our basic human curiosity and so people were able to ask those detailed questions and having the full scale model there was uh, was a remarkable it wasn't just a draw but you know people came up to me and asked me well how are you going to get the data back to earth and i'm like look there's the antenna on the full scale model that's that's how we're going to get it back so it allowed a level of discussion that was deep Deeper than you would get at a at a public talk. And I think I want to add one, just one quick thing as as the slideshow keeps going. I, that it was not only scientists, right? I mean, there were lots of scientists, but there were lots of people there that were engineers. That they're, they're, they're the people that really make uh, the web possible, so to speak, for all scientists like me to eventually get our data. And I think most of the interesting talks were also by given by engineers showcasing, you know, the hardware. For example, Mike McClare. Uh, we had this incredibly successful. Uh, um, um, video, if you will, streaming from the clean room at uh, Goddard, uh, and Mike McClare at uh, Goddard was also, you know, was basically asking questions. The audience could, could ask questions and take a look at uh, exactly what's in the clean room right now. We had talks about, you know, from Northrop folks like Blake or Scott Willoughby, uh, basically sh sh showcasing how hard it is to put a telescope a million miles away and what the drawbacks and what are the things you have to do uh, to actually get it out there. Uh, and not uh, ticked off the scientists because uh, they still want to do their science. And, and it was actually, uh, it was a fascinating, fascinating thing. And so I just want I would like, I would like to, to see if there was a better way to communicate my excitement. But it was, uh, was an absolutely stunning event in many, many respects. So at least um, for me. Al Alberto, if I could jump in for a second. Um, I don't know if you all can see my screen. Yes. But I'm sharing um, one of my favorite photos from the event, which was we actually had a stage as well next to the full scale model. And at one point, we pulled on. Um, Dr. John Mather and Scott Willoughby, the Northrop Grumman program manager for the Webb Telescope. We pulled them on stage so that um, the audience could ask a scientist, ask an engineer a question. And look at this crowd here that gathered just to listen to these two people um, share their expertise. Um, the crowd was so diverse. You'll see um, there's a gentleman here. Um, main in focus with dreadlocks and then to the left we have a family, a little girl hugging her dad just looking over at our Nobel laureate sharing his experience. So this image for me just kind of highlights the the huge and diverse outreach that we had at South by Southwest. Yeah, and I want to add one more thing, which is I think, you know, it, it was a large event, and there are lots and lots of things we're going to still talk about, but one of the interesting things that I thought was uh, something that we work very hard to do is to engage the public that was also not a South by Southwest, you know, to do a lot of media outreach, if you will, through social media. And so I want to bring Maggie in, which was sort of the, you know, to, together with Stratus, sort of the brains around maintaining this, our microsite, we had, a, we had an, an event site, we had a Twitter stream. So how hard was it to do and what was different this time than any other time, Maggie? Well, I, I think we really wanted to reach not only people going to South by Southwest, but the people that weren't there. And we wanted to be careful that we weren't alienating the people not there by only talking about things relevant to people at the festival. So, for instance, we didn't want to overload our Twitter feed and our Facebook with South by Southwest scheduling because that was going to annoy people quickly and we didn't want to lose followers. So that was kind of the dilemma of how do we bring this to people so that if they're not there, they can sort of still take part in it, but we don't alienate anyone for you know being too much. So one of the great ideas was this microsite, which we have, which is still up. Um, if you're interested in seeing it, go.nasa.gov slash JWSTSXSW. Um, that's our microsite. And it basically collected all of our social media in one place so that people interested in learning more about what we were doing at the festival could see it all in one place. So for instance, we have um, we had we put together a blog. So several of us, myself included, were blogging the whole weekend about what was going on, what we had in the tent, pictures, um, you know, what, what the speakers were talking about, and all those got fed into the microsite. 
Um, we also had our Twitter feed. We had a Foursquare check-in, which was kind of cool. We actually got a Foursquare check-in for the full-scale model itself, yeah. so people could check in at the model. So those are displayed on the micro site. We had maps. We had an event schedule. Um, and just basically all our social media in one place. Oh, we had a Flickr a slideshow embedded. Mm -hmm. So all those things were available in one place, but they were also available on the usual social media places. So key things or the best pictures we tweeted and Facebooked, and we put together a huge set on Flickr too, which did really, really well. We got a huge number of viewers on our Flickr set, which was awesome. And I want to give a shout out to Chris Gunn, who's our master photographer, who took amazing images yeah. the whole weekend. And also Chris Evers, who's I believe he's at Norfolk. Uh, Alex. Um, Alex Evers. Yeah. Alex Evers, I'm sorry. Alex Evers, he took amazing pictures too, both of them. So we had really great quality images. And the full scale model with the Austin backdrop in the background was amazing. We had videographers, Mike McClare from NASA and Mary Station from Space Telescope, were taking video the whole weekend. Mary does our behind the web um, video podcast out of Space Telescope. So she put together a whole slew of videos, and Mike McClare not only did um, this amazing time lapse of the full scale model being constructed, but as I think Alberto mentioned, he also did these Skype um, conversations between the, the NASA clean room and South by Southwest, which worked out amazingly well. And the people in the clean room could show real JWST hardware that they are working on right then. And with, with the um, Microsoft pad, they could kind of you know show what they were working on, and people at South by Southwest could ask questions of the actual people working on the project. And that, that went incredibly smoothly, and I think that was really exciting. So. Yeah. So what do you think worked? What do you think worked best, Maggie? Of all the different areas, what was the? What do you think was the most uh, successful in terms of all the social stuff you were monitoring? That's really hard to say. Um, Sounds like the picture, the Twitter, or the uh, the uh, Flickr. Flickr accounts. I think the images, because images make such a big impression, and right. you know, they're available in lots of places. But they did exceedingly well. Um, and again, we had just gorgeous imagery of the weekend that you can see in the slideshow. Oh, one other thing we did for social media was that. Um, NASA headquarters had a, a NASA social, which if you're not familiar with those, um, they used to be called tweet yeah. ups, and people who are on social media will get together and be granted special access. There's a, is that a picture of the tweet up? No. Um, so anyway, we granted special yeah. access to an event, and so we had people come by Sunday morning, and they got to meet John Mather and Jason and Amber and, and Scott from Northrop Grumman, and they got to, you know, answer questions and ask questions and be given a presentation about the Big Space Telescope, and that was really exciting. All right, so Christina, there was also a, a traditional media component to this whole thing too, right? You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yes, thanks. Um, we also had a designated media area set up inside of our tent so that uh, media could stop by and ask questions. And as you mentioned earlier, um, Amber and Jason were really the rock stars of the media that weekend, um, along with Scott Willis our program manager from Northrop. Um, we had them in front of the media throughout the weekend. Um, one um, great visit that we had was on Friday from um, Congressman Lamar Smith, and with him, um, a lot of the local television stations, radio stations came out. Um, but in addition to local media, I was actually really surprised by the um, international media coverage at South by Southwest. We had people stop by from HBO Latin America, from um, Denmark, and uh, radio stations in France. And they just were really curious to learn more about the project and about the international partnership on the Webb Telescope. So um, ESA and the Canadian Space Agency, they're also contributing to the program. So it was a great way to tie in the uh, worldwide effort of the Webb Telescope. And the other exciting thing is that the media coverage is actually continuing long after South by Southwest. Just earlier today, Amber um, did a podcast for the Guy Show. And after South by Southwest, the Weather Channel came out to our Northrop Grumman facilities to get a tour of our hardware at Space Park. So, um, And then, Jason, do you want to uh, share a little bit about the article that you wrote for CNN also as a follow-up? I thought that was really awesome. Yep. Yeah, so CNN found out about this event and they asked us to summarize what it meant for the future STEM education. So some of the points that we've highlighted before about having a scientific vision and then executing that with this marriage between engineering and science was something that I talked about in that article. And they uh, they actually posted it on their Light Years blog and they kept it up there for uh, the whole Oop. weekend. 
And so it's no. up there right now. It's a second article given this dark matter detection that's been uh, that's been <laughs> announced. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was uh, it was it was really nice to uh, you know it was really nice for them to ask us to do that. Yeah, okay, Blake, you had a comment you wanted to say. Oh, I just wanted to underscore something that Maggie said a minute ago, which was um, that made this, again, just so different from some other activities. Like what, what Maggie did was create an opportunity where you could actually feel like you were there in the clean room talking to the engineers at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And I think the combination of that with being able to stand and reach out and touch a, a model of James Webb Space Telescope is something that you really, I don't think people have ever had an opportunity to do before. Uh, we've all seen uh, uh, beautiful pictures of the Hubble Space Telescope. We've seen pictures of Apollo missions and the uh, other amazing uh, hardware that's been built. But this was an opportunity, you know, when you ask yourself, why did people stop what they're doing and come and be part of this? I think it's because you, you, you truly did get to be interactive. You got to reach out and touch this thing that's going to eventually be one million miles away from the Earth, never to return. And you got I to did. I touched it. <laughs> <laughs> He there. said it. He well, said it live. I did. I also want to also want to mention another aspect, which is I think it's coming out here because the event was so was I mean was very complex to put together because we had many many facets to this uh, something that I can only call an, like an immersive event. Really, it was very immersive, even though we were not you know in a closed environment just because of the model and everything else. But there was a, another component, which was the fact that uh, our team. Team, you know, the, our core team was relatively small, and even the team that we we sort of uh, coordinated was relatively small because uh, we we were really really happy to have uh, uh, start a collaboration with the University of Texas, and we had 20 plus volunteers, maybe more actually. I don't know what the final count was. That really really worked very very hard uh, uh, for those three days because we all we all did, but they really worked extra hard uh, to uh, engage the folks that were going by the model to tell them what was inside the tent to explain to them uh, the science that Webb was going to do to explain to them the challenges and really my hat goes out to them because it, it was a tremendous effort that UT put together and uh, and it, I don't think it would have happened as nicely uh, if, if, it, if they were not part of it. I don't know what, what people think but I, I thought it was awesome. Well, and I think one of the, um, and it's already been mentioned a couple of times, but one of the great things about this event is that I think the public really saw it as a very um, integrated event. So it wasn't like, you know, Space Telescope was there and NASA Goddard was there and Northrop Grumman was there. You know, it was it was, it was was kind of a, a, a big team effort and it came across as a very unified effort. So I think that was a, a big success and um, I think the public saw that. I think the public saw it as one big awesome mission that was this big partnership and um, that's how we do big science is by doing uh, good partnerships and um, the, the again the, the the lasting impact of this has been really surprising to me uh, in a good way um, you know we had such a, a high impact event for those three days that we were there um, but um, a couple of you guys have already mentioned that you know, we're still we're getting we're still getting articles. We're getting podcasts. Yep. I just did a podcast today. Um, the the Skype with the the engineers in the clean room um, that resulted in um, a live Skype chat with the governor of Massachusetts yesterday here at Goddard that I participated in. <laughs> um, so they were so this um, school in Massachusetts wanted to showcase their their brand new um, uh, broadband capabilities um, out in Western Mass and, and they somehow um, got connected with the Skype event that we did and they said well we want to use NASA for to showcase this this um, awesome new internet that we had so um, it's really it's the the impact has been ongoing and there are still articles popping up about our presence there so it's it's been really um, really great to see that okay so Maggie had her virtual hand up go ahead Maggie <laughs> You had a comment. Oh, you're muted. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm unmuted. There you go. Well, I was just going to uh, jump off of what Blake was saying. That, um, in my experience, even on social media, the tech story is often really hard to tell in a way that interests people. Because when you post images of pretty galaxies or beautiful things in space, people latch onto that right away. But the tech story often is pictures of hardware. How do you get people excited about that? And I think that this was perfect for that because we had the full scale model there. We had, you know, demo pieces of of hardware there and. And we were really telling a lot of the tech story in a way that people were engaged by it because, and, and with the Skype right there, it was, they were really a part of it and it was around them and it was interactive. And I think that was really exciting because that is a very difficult thing to do. And, and I have to say that, uh, <laughs> if I may, that uh, um, 
we we when we. When, I may. When, when, we start, when we started doing this, I think we, we really, really, all of us, and I think it's, to some, to some extent, it's to, to our credit, we started thinking completely out of the box. You know, we had ideas that never materialized. We had some ideas that didn't materialize. And one of the craziest ideas, which I'm really happy that materialized, was, again, Stratus's idea to do a, a world record, record attempt for the largest outdoor lesson in astronomy. And so Christina was involved with this. So can you tell me, you know, I thought it was a crazy idea at the beginning, but I think what well, we pulled it off, we pulled it off in probably the, in the best, uh, in terms of weather, the best day possible, and it was a great success. Christina, okay, but I just want to say it. you don't have to oh. qualify it as outdoor. I mean, it, 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 it was just the world's largest one. That's all. Oh, the world's no, largest. That's right. That's right. And, and I, still I think, think it was the, crazy. the key thing about the, the Guinness World Record attempt was that it wasn't just something fun and crazy to do. It was it was actually a real STEM outreach right. effort. We were reaching out to the community to teach them about uh, science in, in a way that was accessible to a lot of people. And so it really got them excited that they could be part of something, you know, setting a world record. But it also gave us an opportunity to teach and, and educate the public about um, some general science lessons. So, I think it was a, a win-win, but the most exciting thing for me was that moment where they jumped on stage and announced that we broke the world record. It was really, you know, the crowning moment to end the weekend. It was a little touch and go there for a while, wasn't it? According to the video, there were uh, some people that, uh, you know, there were people coming and going, and there was some nervousness there for a while, right? Exactly. Um, we were we were getting a little nervous because um, the Guinness rules require that people had to and uh, people came over and said you know I'm, I'm really tired I'm hungry I need to leave so we <laughs> just kept begging the people please stay the full 30 minutes you know you'll be part of history so and, and, and it was all cold too and it was a little it, cold too. it was a little bit chilly but luckily yeah. people had a good attitude about it and they uh, stuck around and and when they left we gave them all stickers of you know participating in the world record and you know, everybody was just excited to be part of it. And it was actually pretty hard to pull off, I thought. I don't know. Yeah, so it's, uh, I need, I, ever, <laughs> ever since the um, thing that happened at the beginning of this Hangout, my browser has been going very slow. I want to get people's comments in here, but my browser is incredibly slow. Alberto, can you see comments on the event page by any chance? Yeah, let me go and see. And take I, a look. I was looking at the... Um, I was looking at some of them on the on the actual YouTube page. Okay, well, I have one here from en Enrico. Oh, I, I yeah. can't read your last name on the Google on the event page. It goes, having made the effort to build this prototype of a telescope. I assume he means the model. How realistic is the idea to make several of them and thereby reducing the hurdles <laughs> for science to happen due to high competition for observing time? Maybe even commercialize some of them. Okay, so I guess he's talking about actually building several web space telescopes. Anybody want to take that? We'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the answer is yes. Okay, we'll, we'll do that. Penny for NASA, I guess, right? <laughs> okay, so um, I think one of the things, Tony, one of the things that we can add to that is that uh, you know, with the Hubble Space Telescope, we only have one as well, and actually having one. One inspires the best science because there's a huge oversubscription to use the telescope so it's only the cream of the crop scientific proposals that get in we think that'll be the same with uh, the James Webb Space Telescope as well yes um, but I, I do think that the, the the person who made the comment really did hit on a great point which is that once you invest in these type of inventions and you figure out how to do things it is cheaper and it is more efficient to do it another time around I, I think that you know you see that inventions were made in the Hubble Space Telescope that we're capitalizing on today with James Webb Space Telescope. And we're, we're, we're reaping those lessons learned in the technology that's been developed. I mean, those things really do push us forward. So I absolutely think that um, the next generation after JWC will, will uh, critically rely on the inventions that are happening today. One of my favorite comments is, yes, people, the James Webb Space Telescope is not the Death Star weapon. <laughs> 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 uh, 
<laughs> it does look. It doesn't look actually. We had talked about this, and Jason was uh, uh, Jason and a few others actually, and myself included. We actually explained to people and Ember as well that it's not exactly a grandfather's telescope. It looks very different from Hubble for lots and lots of reasons, and I think uh, uh, that went well. And uh, when you tell these people that you know, we tell people that it's a telescope, but they look at you a little weird because they imagine a tube like a Hubble, if you will. And uh, so I think I thought having the, the telescope there was actually an interesting reminder of what uh, kind of technology. Uh, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, trade-offs you have to do in order to launch a telescope that big. Uh, okay, so I am, I am, back. I am really trying to get my screen to. Oh, this is, this uh, is really frustrating. Hang on. So the, one, one additional point on that. I mean, the other thing with those technologies is they actually lead to a lot of spin-offs as well. So for the James. Webb Space Telescope project, there were 10 new technologies that were designed, you know, just to make the telescope that could satisfy that scientific vision. Oh, and now those technologies are impacting many, many different fields. Uh, you know, for example, to measure the smoothness of the James Webb Space Telescope's mirrors, a new generation of optical sensors had to be created that could measure very, very small, you know, deviations at the nanometer level. And those optical sensors are now being used, um, you know, to help correct uh, diseases in human eyes, help with laser eye treatment surgeries and things like that. Also, you know, maybe I can go back to also what was uh, something else that uh, was inside the tent, which we kind of didn't mention. So I think, uh, you know, in, on the event page, there's some pictures. There's a picture I see of, uh, of some of the Microsoft folks, uh, in particular Tony, uh, Tony, I mean, um, Jonathan Fay, who is the principal developer. Uh, at uh, Microsoft, they actually wrote uh, the Worldwide Telescope software. So not only we developed this uh, this sort of uh, tours and these presentations on the wall, but we also had on the side, Mike, on the side of this uh, of the wall, we had this very very interesting uh, um, exhibit, if you will, that was brought by Microsoft late into the game and actually was a huge success. We had two 82-inch touch screens from a company called per Perceptive Pixel, which was uh, has been bought by Microsoft, which are were basically like candy for kids. I mean, we had to basically tell kids to go away from those screens because they would never move. And we had, uh, you know, the Worldwide Telescope playing on them. We had uh, this app that was developed just for us uh, uh, during uh, those three days by Microsoft. And that was also a pretty tremendous success in a sense that you could engage people not only through talks uh, like uh, scientists and engineers were doing, but also through uh, what I called impromptu talks, you know, talks that you will give, uh, you know, to whoever was there standing by. Hey, there you go. Thank you, Jason, for putting up the picture that was of the screen, for example. And and this was actually amazing. And then additionally, Microsoft went even a step further. With the, all the volunteers had this uh, had Microsoft surfaces, um, mostly when it wasn't raining, unfortunately, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, which were also loaded with the same app you could actually use on the screen, so so people were actually being able to uh, ask questions and and uh, and have these talks with the volunteers who were also astronomers or graduate students, expert in astronomy or engineering, and it was actually quite a very very different. Uh, uh, sort of approach that we have for the public, so it was almost like a one-on-one, -on -one, but on it with a ton of people, and I thought that would went extremely well. Yeah. Near one of these eighty-inch screens, he actually started asking us some detailed probing questions uh, <laughs> yes. about the solar system, <laughs> about astronomy in general. So it was very interesting. Yeah, it was very, very, uh, very, very engaging, and in in a way that actually, I think, uh, I don't know what you guys think. That's actually an interesting question. That was my biggest surprise, which was, okay, we, we had these ideas, and we wanted to do something completely out of the box, and I think most of it worked. But uh, uh, I, 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 I don't know. To me, uh, the impact that we had was actually much larger than I thought that I thought we had. I mean, I ended up, I was really, really tired at the end of those three days. <laughs> we gave so many talks. We slept so little, but it was... But we were going on adrenaline, which was unbelievable because we had so many people so engaged in astronomy that I, I, I've never felt something like that. Yeah, and I think, you know, whenever we go out and do these kind of, um, you know, outreach activities and public talks, and again, a lot of this has been sustained, which is great, you know, um, and all of us, I think, here and, and, and the speakers that we had at South by Southwest, people are always talking about, you know, well, you have so much energy, you're so passionate about it, and, you know, my answer is that it is easy to be excited about something like this, right? This telescope is so Absolutely. amazing. I mean, it's going to, I mean, it really is going to revolutionize how we think about the universe. You know, Hubble did that. 
um, Hubble rewrote our textbooks, and I'm sure that this telescope uh, will do that as well. So yeah, it was really tiring. Uh, we were all there for you know all day long, all three days, um, but it was worth it. And again, it's easy to be excited about this stuff. Okay, so I have a question for all of you. So now let's hope you know this is you know how do we follow up with this? What I mean, this is like. <laughs> Do we, we don't want to, we, we want to build on this. So what's, what's next for, do you think, for, uh, for the web and the APO efforts? Silence. <laughs> it's a hard act to follow. It's a very really hard act to follow. It's a hard act to follow, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah. I, I think the, the work that Maggie does, and, and Maggie, I'll, I'll let you speak for yourself there on that, but um, the social media um, is a way for us to continue the conversation um, with, Everyone that we encountered in South by Southwest, we picked up, um, I'm not sure the exact number, but we picked up a ton of new followers, um, and we continue to pick up um, new people to follow our um, NASA Web Telescope account on Twitter and our North of Grumman account. Um, and that's just a way for us to continue the conversation. Long after an event dies down, um, we can still continue to give people updates on our program and milestones that we're achieving. Um, but also, you know, it's an important um, thing for us to remember um, to go out and uh, connect with the public, to um, invite students and teachers to come in um, when they can to interact with our engineers and our scientists so that they can learn and then go out and share in the community um, what they've seen. I think it's cool. exciting for me that people are still talking about it because um, one of the, the blogs I stumbled across was um, these people had picked up a comic book. We, we put out a video called Infrared Beyond the Visible. Um, it has amazing graphics, and they made a comic book version of it that we could hand out, which was is really cool. But you know how you know conferences and conventions go. You take a lot of paper with you, and usually you toss it all. But this blog, you know, these people had actually read through the comic, and they were actually having a podcast to discuss what they had learned from it. And I thought that was so exciting that you know that they actually took something away. And even weeks after the event, they were still talking about it. And actually, Amber went on their podcast, I believe. Um, yeah, that so was the one. That was the one I did earlier today. So I think that's supposed to be on iTunes tomorrow, maybe. Yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. But it's nice to know that that people did take something away, and they're still talking about it. So maybe we're retaining some of that audience that we got at South by Southwest. <laughs> yeah, actually. You know, oh. No, go ahead, Blake. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, in terms of the question about what comes next, I mean, I think what's happening as uh, as time marches forward, we're essentially we're replacing that mock-up of the James Webb Space Telescope with the real James Webb Space Telescope. About seventy-five percent of the observatory is actually already built, has been fabricated, and uh, we're focusing on the integration and testing of the instruments and all the major hardware. Um, and you know, in a short time, you'll have the the real. Um, James Webb Space Telescope mirrors, optics, and instruments living at the NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. And you'll see the uh, real observatory marching uh, back and forth across the country to different test sites and integration sites as it's being built up. So what we're really hoping to do is capitalize on the, the new audience that we've reached um, that Christina and Maggie were describing and to be able to have, uh, have you all follow along with us as we go to the launch pad in 2018. I agree. I think I think the, probably the overall goal is uh, I call uh, maybe it's a little harsh, but I call it I call it it's almost like a gateway drug or something, you know, in a sense that once you get hooked on JWST, you want to really learn about what it could do, and once you learn about the science, the challenges, and everything, uh, I, I don't think it's just me. I think it's lots of people are really hooked and uh, and and they want to learn more. The, you know, the, the questions we had are not. Uh, we're so many and so different, and people are, have different interests in you know in, in the sun shield and why it's so far away, why it needs to be cold, and why why can't you build a mirror that big, uh, you know, and uh, what kind of science are you gonna do? Are you really gonna see all the way to the Big Bang? You know, all, I mean, they went on and on and on, and there were uh, there were like a, a microcosm of what people are really interested in 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 knowing and why I think uh, telescopes like Hubble and JWST eventually will actually do they will, they sort of put us in a different place, and I think in the universe, and they do revolutionize where we stand on that so yeah absolutely I mean it's so much bigger than any other telescope that we've had before that it's going to be so much more powerful so you're kind of looking at the universe in a way that you've never done before and so not only will it answer those fundamental questions but it's going to turn up a lot of new discoveries as well that's equally exciting so I want to read a couple of comments real quick because we're running out of time and people are commenting we've got to get to the the social part of this and wow this 
the actual Atlas Centaur ELV is watching YouTube. I did not know that. Uh, has two comments. <laughs> the goes uh, uh, has a comment for Amber. Says, by the way, Amber, nice Twitter name. I love puns too. How about that? <laughs> rockets, yeah. rockets can love puns. That's awesome. Twas a dream. Twenty two. OMG. 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 These are all on YouTube, by the way. Yeah. I'll look at. Uh, can't wait for this to launch. Um, I'm I'm so excited. Atlas, the the vehicle, said again. I'm so excited to see the Webb Telescope launched by an Ariane Five. That's a good point. Anybody want to comment on why we're doing that? Well, this this whole telescope is a, is a partnership between NASA and the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency, and um, the European Space Agency is providing our launch vehicle. So um, the Ariane Five is. Um, you know, one of the most heavy launch heavy launchers. Uh, it's or it's most reliable. So um, yeah, we're using it because we need a, a really huge rocket to put this really huge telescope into space. Um, and so that's why we're using the Ariane Five. Twas a dream. Twenty two asks. Speaking of, will the public get a chance to see the actual telescope before launch? Um. I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, you know, because of the nature of the materials and the sensitivities of these uh, of the equipment it's not something that is broadly available for folks um, but we had the insight to think a little bit ahead and the uh, area at the Goddard Space Flight Center and also at uh, North Grumman Aerospace Systems in Redondo Beach California both of those facilities uh, the leadership there installed viewing areas so that if you are um, or if you are visiting the area uh, and you have a access for a tour, you can come up and look through the window and see some of that work, but because these mirrors are so sensitive, um, they have to be very well protected all the time so that they remain pristine. But I think that's why the things like what Maggie's doing with the webcam to be able to watch from your home, the you know, observatory and built, built up is such an amazing opportunity. So if you go to our, um, our website here at Goddard, it's just jwst.nasa.gov, right there on the front page. There it is. There Thanks go. for whoever brought that yep. up. Um, you can, you can uh, click on a link and watch the webcam. So you can actually watch um, the pieces of the telescope coming together here in the clean room at Goddard. And I also want to mention a few other things, actually. So uh, the, if you want to learn more about the web. I mean, you can start from what the, the website that just uh, the Emily ju just like I mean that um, Amber just gave you, jwst.nasa.gov. But we all you know from there you can go in many other directions. Uh, you can come to uh, our own site uh, right here, HubbleSite.org, uh, where you can find uh, information about education in general. We have an iBook that runs on iPads where you can learn more than you ever wanted about James Webb and how he's going to uh, revolutionize astronomy. And most of the things that we actually did uh, and, and talked about at um, at Aust in Austin, uh, we also going uh, planning on releasing the app that we ran at uh, that was made from uh, for Microsoft Surfaces uh, that we ran at um, uh, South by Southwest uh, to the to the Windows uh, Store relatively soon. So I look for that as well. So there's lots of opportunities to learn. And then. Uh, I think, as always, uh, you know, uh, you should uh, stop any of us or, or anybody or stop any astronomer, actually. You should stop any astronomer and ask the, him or her to explain to you uh, the things you're interested in. That's their job. That's the way I see it. <laughs> I just want to add that you can find all our stuff. You guys are paying for it. On our website, also. You guys are paying for it. Then Thank you. There you go, Jason. Okay, and we also have a JWST iBook. Who wants to talk about that? Alberto? Yeah, I just mentioned that. Uh, so there's a there's a JWST iBook. Uh, I think if you go to abelsite.org, uh, there's a link to that, and you can uh, download that. It's uh, it's basically it's a um, it's an interactive book that runs on uh, on iOS on iPads. For now, we have uh, a PDF uh, for uh, other platforms. We're working on something similar for Windows and. Uh, if anybody knows something, some good software we can use for Android, please uh, let us know because we have a hard time finding some software. We would like to release it for any platform after 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 all. Um, and the book is uh, is basically a a, a small. Uh, sort of a compendium, so to speak, that will give you an idea of the science uh, of a web, the engineer of web, and it was put together by the Office of Public Outreach here, but also by uh, one of my summer students uh, last uh, year, I think, uh, um, uh, Nelly, who was actually absolutely wonderful. And 
uh, so uh, it is it allows you basically to see what uh, you could have seen if you were in Austin uh, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> if you weren't so busy, you couldn't come to Austin, which I can't imagine why. Uh, a, a quick, a quick note to follow us on social media. You can find all our links um, for all our social media um, outlets on that website, jdrst.nasa.gov, right there on the home page. Right. You can find out how to follow us on Twitter and how to follow us on Facebook. Um, and the conversation on Twitter is um, under um, hashtag JWST. Yeah, and and so, thanks again to Maggie because she's the the um, the mastermind behind all of our social. Media. <laughs> yeah, she does an awesome job. Yeah, yeah, she has a great job. <laughs> all right, so uh, we're we're running out of time, guys. Do you have any closing comments? Anybody want to say anything uh, in conclusion? Uh, I, maybe I'll, I'll try to say something. I don't know. If maybe everybody feel free to add something. I th I thought it was uh, it was really an honor to work with, with everyone, not just the folks who are here, but it was uh, an unbelievable experience. That I think uh, we would like. I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm not speaking. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm speaking just for myself. But I, I would like to repeat that experience. It was an incredible experience, as uh, as all of us uh, have mentioned. I think at, at different times during this hangout, uh, it was uh, basically a team effort uh, we're very 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 little egos if, if at all and everybody had one goal in mind which was to all the public with the, what the web will do for science and how hard it is to put it uh, you know to put it together and uh, and to uh, and to put it into orbit and I thought we did an incredible job I was, I was really humbled to be working with a uh, with 150 or so people that, that we put together and it was a fantastic event yeah, so, uh, oh, well, go ahead. Go ahead, sorry, Blake. One quick, just one quick comment, uh, you know, about closing. I just want to say to everybody out there, thanks, thanks for watching us. And if you're excited about astronomy, uh, you should talk about it and talk about it with your friends and family and community leaders. Because, like Jason pointed out, um, it, this is an investment that we make uh, as a country, and it's important. And we want to um, we want to keep that support going. So, uh, you know, events like this that Tony's uh, organizing are fantastic, but. Um, Keeping that conversation going and uh, letting the world know that uh, we care about doing things like that is, is really important. Yeah, the reason we're building this is so that we can find out stuff, so that we can learn answers to questions that we want to find out and also answers to questions we haven't even thought to ask yet. So this is why we're doing it and it's important work and if we don't do it, you know, I, I, you know what's going to happen? We don't know. So these are important, uh, this is important work and, we, and, and the best way that people can can show how, what, you know, how they support and feel about it is to talk about it like Blake said. That was a great point. Anybody else? Alberto, are you going to tell them? Which? I, 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 can, I, I can tell them if you won't. Oh, uh-oh. Uh, Why did I forget? <laughs> oh, come on, you know, you know what happened, right? You were, you were putting this event together, and uh, you, know, you were one of the guys in charge, and we, we all sort of gave you a tagline. You, you, what, do you want, us to, you want me to tell you what it is? Remember what, what it was? Yes, please, please. I can't remember. The, the tagline? I blank. You, you, were you were giving everybody instructions, telling everybody to do things, and it was like uh, we gave you a – it was a dinner that one night. We gave you a tagline. Oh, man, I can't yeah. remember. What was it? Uh, the, the Italian Larry the Cable Guy. Get her, get her done. <laughs> yeah. Oh, your... <laughs> get her done. Yes. yes. Get her <laughs> done. Get her done. That was Alberto. That was Alberto. I forget that. I forgot. Telling people, telling people to do things, and uh, you know, he would just say, get her done. Get her done. Bravo, bravo. See, si, bravo. Get her yeah. done. Yeah, <laughs> trying to speak uh, with a Texans accent, with my Italian accent. That, was, that came out great. <laughs> I wish, wish we had that on video. I really do. <laughs> no, I wish not. We should not have that on video. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm getting it. I'm getting it on video. You're gonna get. I'll do it just for you. We have it. We have a take, and then we can sell that. There you go. We can fund that's our right. efforts like that. Make, make, make tea. That's right. We can make t-shirts <laughs> and all kinds. Get her done. I can't do it. Can't do it with an Italian accent. Well, there was a lot, lot of getting done. stuff done. There was a lot of getting stuff done by all of us, and I think I appreciate everyone. So that's right. Guess that's the way. Is that the way the Italians would say it? Getting the stuff done. That's not the way you do it. It's get her. <laughs> Let's get it done with it. Do it. I don't know. We need an accent, but I cannot do it right now. I was scared of any of your viewers. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thank you all.
all so much. Um, we we've uh, just to, before I let everybody go, I want to thank Amber Strawn. Amber, you were awesome. You were a rock star out there, giving all those great interviews. You can follow her on Twitter with Astronomer, as her on her hashtag there. So please follow her, Blake and, and Christina. I, I is an honor and great privilege to work with you guys out there. It's really great. I never I didn't get much of a chance to interact with the Northrop side of this whole thing. It's always been you know just on the the NASA side. So for for me. It was a real pleasure to work with you guys to see how the other how the private sector does things. So thank you very much, and Christina, awesome. Thank you for all. The, and uh, you were a rock star. I, I loved I loved when the the storm was coming up on Saturday, and yeah. Christina comes into the tent. She goes to Alberto. She grabs him by the shoulder. She goes, "I'm calling it Alberto. We're going home. It's not safe." <laughs> And so she sent us all home and made us and took care of everybody. She was in charge. That was awesome. Thanks, Christina. Thank and you. and Jason, as always, True story. lots of lots of stuff. Lots of it was lots of fun having you here and uh, the interviews you gave. The, the, you were one of the public faces up there, and it was just really awesome to see the work you did. So thank you, and Thanks, Maggie. Tony. Maggie, it's really a pleasure to. Uh, oh, um, I wanted to. Did you get a chance? To, we did say the hashtags, right? The, for for all the social stuff, did yes. we do that? I was That's busy looking at comments for a while there. Can, can you post them on the event site yes. after it's done? Yeah, I'll, I'll post it on the description box and also on right. the event page as well. So thank you, Maggie, for joining us. It was a lot of fun. And guys, um, that's it for this this Space Fan Hangout. Thank you. One all more thing. One more thing. Oh, okay. Wait, wait, one more thing. I just yeah. want to say thank you to Stratus as well. Oh, Stratus, yes. dude! If you're watching, man, if you had showed up, I probably would have started crying. I'm, I really miss you. Thank you for all the work you did. It was, you were you were great. You were awesome, and we miss you terribly. So we w wish you nothing but the best, and just know our thoughts are with you. And I guess with that, I'm gonna go and get a Kleenex. And <laughs> so thank you all for watching. And as always, keep looking up.